Ahem. All right, here we go. Here we go. Whoa. <laughs> that ain't the right voice. Let's see. I seem to have forgotten. Let's just... Uh, let's... Deepen that just a little bit. Okay, try again. <laughs> just like falling off a log, man. All right, let's bring that up. Bring that up. Okay, bring that up. Getting closer, getting closer, getting closer! Ooh, there it is. I'm back, baby! It's the John Huff Podcast. Yes, we are back, kids. Leaner, meaner, just a little obscener. The John Huff Podcast is off hiatus. And we're back in the little studio, and we're coming into your ear holes, my friends. We're not actually meaner. Meaner's not my style. We're not actually obsceneer either. Although, you know, in my research about podcasting and about entertainment in general, you know, it doesn't hurt to be a little bit titillating. So being a bit more obscene probably would help the ratings along. But hey, we're a family show. From day one, we have presented ourselves as family entertainment in the mold of the great Sam Kinison. Also, you know, a proponent, a beacon, an icon of family entertainment. And that's what we still are in the JHP, but we are definitely leaner, I will say that. Now, at one point in my life, I was an advertising copywriter, okay? And what I learned very quickly is that rhyming plays well. <laughs> rhyming and alliteration. So if you're going to lie about a commercial product, the way to do that to get the money out of the people is to make sure you do a lot of rhyming and a lot of alliteration, okay? So today I've chosen rhyming, meaner, leaner, just a little obscener, leaner, meaner, just a little obsceneer. Get your tagline straight, man. <laughs> We are leaner. I presented a brand new shortened intro. Hope you like that. Also got some new art going. You know, it's a whole new day. <laughs> and my buddy Jason Rake, designer extraordinaire, did the new cover art. If you have not seen it, go take a look. You can find it on the gram. And Jay also did the layout for the November book, of which I still have a few copies, by the way. The November book is the first European tour blog I wrote when the Sarah Smith band trundled across the waves like pioneers in reverse, as I called us, conquering the old world. Back in 2017, man, and doesn't that feel like a long, long time ago? We decided to print that tour blog, which was all digital on my website. Sarah and I decided to turn that into a book. Nice little piece of merch, kids. And we needed somebody to lay that thing out for us. And my boy Jason Rake was the guy for the job. Did a great job on that. Did a great job on the new cover art. Thank you, Jay, for doing that. Very much appreciated. I had to go away, all right? I'm still struggling to this moment with how I interact with the social media. And I had reached a point, you know, a month ago, six weeks ago, whenever it was, where I just found myself in exactly the position they want you in, all right? Just mindlessly, for hours, you know, off and on throughout the day, just scrolling the social media, just scrolling the feeds, Looking for nothing, getting the dopamine hits, you know? And I was making the classic mistake, you know? There are three classic mistakes. The first is never get involved in a land war in Asia. The second is never go up against a Sicilian when death is on the line. And three is don't read the dang comments on the social media. But I found myself getting pulled in and reading things and just getting mad. I did not engage. I did not interact. Maybe I should have, might have helped, you know, just get it out of the system. Just put it out of you and into the ether <laughs> and it goes away. But no, I kept it inside just and just reading stuff people wrote. And we know the trolls are out there in force, just writing provocative things, just writing snide things, insulting things, just trying to get a rise out of people. 
probably, you know, like the social media apps hire people who do that because it keeps the rest of us engaged, right? So they hire an army of people under fake kind of accounts, you know, and they just come on and write insulting things everywhere and write provocative things everywhere and take the contrary view and insult people and get people's, you know, get them all rankled up. Is that a word? I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is the game. Like maybe actually Twitter hires people to just be dicks on Twitter because it makes everybody else mad. And anger is a more useful emotion than sadness. You know, basic human psychology is one of my subroutines. Anyways, I had to go because it was just getting to me. And at the same time, man, I fell into the trap again. You know, getting frustrated by the kind of ego metrics on the podcast. You know, it's very easy to do that. You watch how successful everybody else's show seems to be. And you watch your own program, and it seems like it's not growing, and you're putting in all this time, and you're putting in all this effort, and it seems like it's not growing, and everybody else is doing great, but it's all smoke and mirrors, man. (laughs) It's largely a grand illusion, you know, everything you find online, especially in the social media world, including podcasts. So people present as if their show's maybe doing better than it is, and it doesn't matter anyways. You're not supposed to get wrapped up in what other people are doing. You're supposed to get wrapped up in what you're doing and what it feels intuitively from within like you ought to do. But man, I'm a human. You know, I am a human being. And I got caught up a little bit in the vanity metrics, the downloads and the streams and all that stuff. And you couple that with the sort of agony of social media, being unable to break away from this thing that hurts you. (laughs) You know, those things in combination was just, you know, a sign to me, a warning to me that it's time to check out, man. Check out, get yourself right, get yourself straight, get your head on, and refashion how you interact with these things. But the whole time, while I did a hiatus episode, you know, I was thinking that this was not the end. This was time for a, a, a repurposing, you know, a reimagining. Had to get back to the roots, man. Had to get back to the core of it all, whatever that is. <laughs> Had to get away from the vanity metrics. Had to get back to what are we doing here and why, you know? And that took me some time to think about it. And so I was very successful at going away from social media. And I'm still largely away from the Twitter and the Facebook, although I'm beginning to be active again on the Instagram. Something about Instagram is different from those other platforms. And I don't know exactly why, and I'm not going to go into it here. But although it's a scrolling magnet, there's no doubt about that. Have to exercise a little bit of discipline. And yeah, there are things where there are comments you can read, and you can fall down that rabbit hole pretty quick. So I got to be vigilant, I got to be diligent, But Instagram seems to be the place where I can maybe function a little. (laughs) And so probably a lot of the podcast stuff you will find on the Instagram. So I went away for a month, six weeks, whatever it was. What did you do on your summer vacation? But all the while I was like, okay, probably this is going to come back eventually. How are we going to do that? And to what purpose, you know? For what intent? I'm still working that out. But I know everybody out there who's listening right now is saying to themselves, what brought you back? You know, you had the suspicions that you would come back eventually. But what was it? What triggered you? What grabbed you by the face and said, all right, man, let's get it going again. And the answer to that, as is the answer to all things, was the king, man. Elvis Presley brought me back. Not Elvis Parsley. (laughs) Elvis Parsley was a running gag on the Walk with Yan cooking program. Now, if you're a certain age, if you're of a certain generation, you know the Walk with Yan cooking program. This is a great show. It was on the 70s, early 80s. Uh, You know, if you're home from school... Oh, happy day if you were home from school faking a stomach ache. And you turn on the TV at like 11 or 2.30 or something like that. 
Like your mom says, all right, you can watch a little TV. Probably all that's going to be on is soap operas and Walk with Yan. And 10 times out of 10, you're picking Walk with Yan. <laughs> I might even do an episode on Walk with Yan. But Stephen Yan was, uh, I think he was from Hong Kong, uh, in Canada via Hong Kong. And he just did Chinese cooking for a Canadian audience. And it was full of just puns. <laughs> Really bad dad jokes before dad jokes, and Elvis Parsley was kind of a running gag on that show. If you've never seen it, Elena, go out there and see if you can find it, because Walk With The End was maybe the best cooking show of all freaking time, man. But it was the king that brought me back, because I was sitting there in my Barco lounger, purchased for $10 at the Goodwill. <laughs> Not a bad pickup there, kids. And I was on the Netflix, and I came across the Elvis documentary. Have you seen this? Elvis Presley, The Searcher. And it's a two-part documentary on the life and times of Elvis Presley, man. And while I was watching that, I've become a big Elvis guy, by the way, in the last six weeks. While I'm watching that, at a certain point, they were just showing some kind of B-roll of Elvis doing something or something going on. I don't remember. But it's like black and white footage, and they're playing over top of this A Mess of Blues by Elvis Presley. Man, I've said this before, A Mess of Blues is one of my formative songs, man. When I was a kid, just a small boy, we had the giant record player that was a piece of furniture. I've talked at length about this. Love grows where my rosemary goes. We've been through it, man, but A Mess of Blues was one of the 45s we had, okay? And it was the B-side to It's Now or Never. Everybody knows It's Now or Never, but not everybody knows A Mess of Blues, and they should, because it's a ripping blues tune. It's a ripping Elvis tune, and I used to listen to it over and over and over and over on this 45 when I was a kid, man. It was for formative music for me. And I hadn't listened to it in 40 years, and then I just heard six seconds of it on this documentary, and it triggered the whole thing. And I got to thinking about Love Grows From My Rosemary Goes, and I got to thinking about Magic by Olivia Newton-John, and I Love Rock and Roll, and some of the stuff we've talked about is formative music, and it warmed my cockles, kids, because it reminded me what the podcast has kind of brought to my life, which was rediscovering a lot of this music, which was talking about it, which was sharing it with you guys out there in podcast land. And then I thought about the people who've written to say, hey, I checked out Liz Stringer and I really freaking love it, as you should. And people who've listened to The War on Drugs and thing, people who have become fans of the music that I've been able to hip them to on this program. And I thought, well, that's a purpose. That's bringing some good into the world. You know, I read a quote recently by Aubrey Marcus. Go listen to the Aubrey Marcus podcast. And it talked about the purpose of life being to enjoy life and to help other people enjoy life. <laughs> and I thought bringing music into people's life is a way to do that. And it's doing it for me, too. And I thought we're doing something here. We are accomplishing something. I'm having these little bits of nostalgia. We're talking about music. I'm being introduced to stuff that I wouldn't have listened to in the past. And there's something good happening there, man. And I thought, maybe that's something to hold on to. And then when I dropped the hiatus sode, however many weeks ago that was, there were nice comments from people. You know, James V and Ronnie D and Dues. And, you know, people wrote to say, hey, this show has helped me. The show has helped me get through the COVID. You know, I like listening. Look forward to it every week. It's been a positive piece of my experience. And I do appreciate that to all of you people and everybody else who's written over 79 episodes to say things like that. And it just reminds me that this can be an act of service, right? So all of that in combination kind of brought me back to where we are right now but you know you gotta lay it at the feet of the king man and i've been digging into the king and i feel like it's time we talked about this okay because again if you're of a certain age if you're of a certain generation and younger you probably got an image in your mind 
of Elvis Presley, okay? And that, that image is late stage Elvis. The white suits with the eagle on the back and the massive kind of bouffant and the sideburns. You know, Viva Los Elvis. And it's not the right Elvis, man. This is bloated Elvis. This is drugged out prescription drug Elvis. This is falling apart Elvis. This is the Elvis that we think about when we laugh about our icons, you know? You see those pictures of Elvis and you're like, man, I don't know what's up with that guy. It's the wrong Elvis. And responsibility for this belongs to Elvis impersonators, okay? Because most of us, that's our only experience of the king, man. Some, you know, like beaded image on a pillow <laughs> from Vegas. And it's Elvis. It's late stage, bloated, dying, literally dying Elvis. And that's what the Elvis impersonators give you. They all come out, the Viva Las Vegas, and they're shaking the thing, trying to. In the white suit and the sequins and the sunglasses and all the like sparkly beads and stuff. And we think that's Elvis. Kitchy Viva Las Elvis. I'm here to tell you it's the wrong Elvis, man. Elvis didn't come from that. Elvis was a blues man, kids. This is a kid coming up in Memphis. You know, this is a kid raised on the Delta Blues. This is a kid who came up listening to Howlin' Wolf and Bo Diddley, you know, and then listening at the same time to the real country music. The real country music, the Hank Snow, the Hank Williams, not this modern country music that you hear on the radio, all right? Got a cold beer, got a pickup truck, got a dirt road, and you're naked. That is not what I'm talking about. And there should be an inquiry into that music, okay? Elvis came up listening to real Delta Blues, man. Being obsessed with real Delta Blues and the real old school country music, okay? And gospel and gospel. Delta Blues, man. Delta Blues is characterized by acoustic guitar licks and harmonica, man. You know, it's distinguished from the Chicago Blues, which is more electric. The, the original Delta Blues, you know what I'm talking about. Muddy Waters and your Robert Johnson, all that stuff. That was Elvis, man. Elvis was a blues man. Viva Las Elvis is the wrong Elvis. We should be remembering the real Elvis, the original Elvis, who took that music, that Delta Blues music, and the original country music, and just a hint of gospel, and just a hint of the, like, 40s crooners, and popularized this thing called rockabilly, all right? Now, he was not the first guy and not the only guy to be taking what was thought to be black music and appropriating it for white audiences, all right? And there was, like, industry behind this. But, you know, this sort of thing was going on all the time, and I will point you to an example, all right? 1954, a band called The Chords releases a tune called Shaboom, all right? You know Shaboom, right? Shaboom, Shaboom. Yeah, da 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 Shaboom, Shaboom. You know Shaboom. It's a classic, man. So the Chords released that tune. Chords are a black singing group, right? And if you listen to that tune, it smokes, man. Life could be a dream. Smokes, man. Killer. Later in the same year, a Canadian band called The Crew Cuts comes along and says, hey, that Shaboom tune really works. It was like a doo-wop kind of thing. And they're like, we're going to do a cover of Shaboom. We're going to release it, okay? So then you listen to the Crew Cuts version of Shaboom, which is great, by the way. And what do you get? You get the suburban white boy version of Shaboom. And then... Ting da ding, ting da ding, ting da ding. Go, life could be a dream. Ting da ding, ting da ding. You flip it over to the courts. Junk a junk a junk a junk. Just smoking, man. Just driving. 
<laughs> what Elvis did is he came in and he took that driving kind of sound and he kept it. He didn't throw it out. He didn't swing it. Ting ka ching ting ting ching cha ching ching cha ching. No, man. Elvis came in and played the Delta Blues. And in fact, when his first recordings were coming out, people thought it was a black artist. A lot of people thought Elvis was a black artist just hearing the music and hearing the voice. And a lot of that audience, the African-American audience, liked Elvis for that reason, right? And a lot of the white audience did not like Elvis for that reason, you know? This guy was not Viva Los Elvis. He was a blues man, and his original records are blues records, man, with a hint of that real country, with a hint of the crooner, with a hint of the gospel, and it's called Rockabilly. You know, forget Viva Los Elvis. Forget all that. Go back to the king, the real king with the leather jackets and the Ed Sullivan show and that kind of raw sexuality that was Elvis, man. Viva Los Elvis, not raw sexuality, okay? That's kind of, you know, especially at the end. And you can see Elvis's last concert. The whole dang thing is online. You can see it on YouTube. And he does great, by the way. You know, there's this myth that Elvis had fallen apart on stage by the time it was over. And while he may not have been young Elvis anymore, as we recognize young Elvis, he still had it, man. Still had the voice, mostly. Still had some presence. But you can tell he's not there. You can tell he's addled. He was on all kinds of prescription drugs, man. Trying to get through depression and some physical stuff, and he was sad and he was lonely. That's a topic for another time. Like, maybe in ten minutes. <laughs> but I want you to remember... The right Elvis. And the right Elvis is Blues Elvis. The right Elvis is Leather Jacket Elvis. The right Elvis is that kid who shook up the freaking world. And you can see this, and I want to point you to the 1968 comeback special, okay? This is where you can see the magic that was Elvis Presley. And I'm not blowing smoke, kids. This dude was the real deal. Let me give you some context, all right? 1968, Elvis has not performed live for seven years, all right? Late 50s, he gets drafted into the army. He's at peak fame, you know? He's been around for a few years. He's Elvis at that point in time. Gets drafted into the U.S. Army. Probably could have found a way out of it. He's Elvis, for crying out loud. Didn't, all right? Accepted his draft, showed up. There's photographs of Elvis, you know, joining, accepting his draft notice. And he gets, you know, he's the real deal. Gets stationed in Germany, whatever's going on over there at that time, Cold War, all that stuff. While he's in Germany, meets a pretty young lady called Priscilla. You know, that's part of the story, too. Goes and does his thing, right? Then he comes back, and then he, like, drops the record. Elvis is back. And okay, that's great. But then he focuses on making movies, wants to be a movie star or his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, one of the uh, sort of great characters, great meaning large and memorable characters of the music world. Not necessarily such a great dude, I don't think. But the focus is on, hey, Elvis, let's do movies, man. And so Elvis spends the better part of the 60s making increasingly bad kind of romantic comedies to accompany increasingly bad and slapped together soundtracks, okay? So this guy who had been a trailblazer and an innovator and set the world on freaking fire in the 50s is now becoming kind of a caricature and kind of a joke. People begin to forget that Elvis is the freaking man, okay? Now, what's going on? The Beatles are happening, you know? Stones are happening. And the whole civil rights movement is happening. And presidents are getting assassinated. And their brothers are getting assassinated. And civil rights leaders are getting assassinated. Vietnam is happening. And here's Elvis making these really kind of lame comedies. He wanted to be a movie star, and he was. And they kept cranking out these films because they kept making money. People like to go see Elvis, man. 
But the music that was accompanying these soundtracks were like, it reached a point where they were hardly trying. <laughs> Just slap Elvis's name on it and throw it out there. You know, it's the soundtrack to whatever. All these films that he made. And this goes on for like eight years, seven years. And the steam is beginning to run out of it. And Elvis is burning out. He's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm an artist, man. And he was, man. This was a kid with big dreams and a real vision. When he start, you know, showed up and started recording for the first time, Elvis was a thing. And he knew what he wanted. And he wanted to be an artist. And he wanted to break ground. You know, and he wanted to do these things. And he wanted to be an actor, but he got stuck, you know, being Elvis. Doing these formulaic, kind of lame musical comedies. And it just became a factory. And you know what happens with a factory, kids? The life goes out of stuff. And the life had gone out of these movies. And the lame soundtracks that go with them. And Elvis is like, this ain't right, man. <laughs> I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm Elvis. Long story short, they, they conspire, Colonel Tom conspires to do an Elvis special on the TV. Let's get you singing again, King, right? Hasn't performed in front of an audience for seven years because he's off in Hollywood making lame movies, right? Colonel Tom's like, let's finance the next movie with money from a comeback special. So let's go to like NBC and get him to front a pile of money to make the next bad movie. And in return, we'll give him a comeback special, right? And it was going to be a Christmas special. <laughs> and Elvis is like, I don't know, man. I don't want to do a Christmas special. <laughs> Elvis didn't like it. Elvis didn't like it, but they worked it out. It's like, we won't do that. We'll do this. So this 1968 special happens. And it's freaking magic, all right? Now, it's filmed. There's some recorded segments, and there's some, like, behind-the-scenes bits. But the crux of this and the stuff you got to see is the live performance, okay? Now, they could have done a big show. They could have done a big arena thing or whatever, you know, the, the whole thing. But they didn't do that. What did they do, kids? They set up a little stage in the round. In the round is a theater term, okay? It means stage in the middle with audience sitting all around, okay? And it's this little stage in the round. And it's just Elvis and a guitar player and his drummer banging sticks on a guitar case. A couple other players involved. Extremely stripped down. It's just a jam. It's just a jam. And so what you get is the real Elvis. The Elvis I want you to remember, okay? Elvis comes out full-on leather. <laughs> the king, man. Leather jacket, leather pants. Looks like a million bucks. He's 33 years old. And there is just this insane magnetism and charisma. The dude was a born performer, all right? Now, before he went on stage, he's a basket case. Tried to call it off. The audience is already there. He's like, I can't do this, man. I haven't performed in seven years. I don't know how this is going to go. People think I'm a joke now. People don't remember me. You know, is everybody just going to laugh about this? I don't know if I can do it. I don't want to go out there. I'm scared. Elvis freaking Presley, man. They get Elvis out on the stage. Like, you got to go, King. Even if you just go out and say hi, <laughs> just go out and wave to the people. Give them something, you know? So Elvis goes out. And I've had this experience before, too, where I've been super nervous to go on. Now, I have not been about to perform for what wound up being nearly half of the American television audience, by the way. I haven't performed for anything like that, but I've been scared going out on shows. And then this, the second you walk out on stage, like something takes over, something just kicks in, man. And it's adrenaline and it's whatever it is. It happens. Happened for the king. And so what you get when you watch this is an absolute master class by a legend. Okay. Elvis goes out there, just an acoustic guitar, leather. Starts playing the blues, man. The real Elvis stuff. Starts playing those old tunes that people remember from the, from the 50s, you know? And the band is cooking, and they're so comfortable together, and they're just having a jam. This is national television. They're just having a jam. No artifice, no BS. 
just the band sitting around playing. And Elvis is ripping on acoustic guitar, and he's eyeballing people, and he's got this twinkle in his eye, and they're eating it up, man. The dude was a freaking pro and an absolute legend. Few people ever have the kind of charisma that Elvis Presley had, man. This sort of aw shucks, you know, this bit of humility. You know, I think Elvis was a really good guy. You watch the 1968 comeback special, you get that vibe. Like Elvis didn't want to hurt anybody. Elvis just wanted to do his thing, man. And you watch him on this special and you're like, yeah. Forget Viva Las Elvis. Forget the white suits. Forget the sequins. Forget all that stuff. Just take a look at this kid. He's not a kid anymore. He's 33. Just take a look at this guy with his acoustic guitar playing the blues. And there are these moments where he just tells a story, you know? And everybody's laughing and they mess up and they forget the words and they're having a laugh about it. And you realize that Elvis was just a good guy. And the dude just wanted to play music. And he was gifted, man. Listen to that voice. Elvis could do a lot of things, all right? One of the reasons you get Pop Elvis, Viva Las Elvis, is that he could do it. He could sing pop. He could sing country. He could sing blues, man. He could sing rock and roll. He was the king. Underrated voice, underrated stage presence, underrated performer. I know it's hard to say that somebody whose nickname is the king is underrated, but he is because we're looking at the wrong Elvis. We're looking at Viva Las Elvis. We should be looking at 1968 Comeback Special Elvis. And if you want to see this, you can on YouTube, all right? I've never seen the whole sort of television production presented in its entirety, but there are clips, and there are a lot of clips of songs of the band just playing in the round, all right? I want you to go, if you do nothing else, go and watch Baby, What Do You Want Me To Do? And man, like I'm watching this and I'm like, this is it. This is the stuff, man. This is a song that 20 years later, with a little distortion and some drums, might have been recorded by Cinderella. It's just got that groove, man. This bluesy freaking groove. And it's killer. And there's an outtake. I don't know if this actually ran in the special. But there's an outtake. If you go look at Baby What Do You Want Me To Do from the 1968 comeback special, you'll find one of two things. You'll find the full song, and you'll go, that dude is the king. Or you'll find this outtake where they play part of it and then Elvis stops and starts telling a story. <laughs> he's just got this, he's making fun of himself. He's doing the lip curl and they're having a laugh about that. And he's telling a story about playing in Florida where the obscenity police, quite literally the police, there to enforce obscenity laws, wouldn't allow him to move on stage. None of this hip shaking stuff. Don't want to whip up the girls into a frenzy. He could only move his finger. And so he's making jokes about just moving the finger like it's dancing sexually, right? Elvis was a master. A storyteller, a performer, amazing charisma. Go check out Baby, What Do You Want Me To Do from the 1968 comeback special and just marvel at what a genius that dude was and how great he was. And when you're tempted, thinking of Elvis... To remember Viva Las Elvis and the scarves, you know, handing them off to the women and all that stuff. And bloated Elvis and peanut butter and banana sandwiches Elvis. And the Elvis who was found dead, keeled over in front of his toilet. Forget all of that. Forget Elvis on pin cushions, all right? Forget all that. Go watch the 1968 Elvis comeback special. And that is the Elvis you should be remembering, man. That is the right Elvis. And I'm developing an obsession with the king because I watch that guy and I'm like, he's the real freaking deal. And it sucks that the enduring memory is that other kitschy, awful Elvis. Awful's the wrong word, but it's not the right Elvis. It's not the groundbreaking Elvis. Go watch that special and you'll see the real king. You will see the real freaking deal, man. Elvis died in 1977, and you know what? He was 42. 42, man. I'm 48 almost. The king was young when he died. There could have been a whole other chapter of Elvis. 80s and 90s, there could have been Elvis jamming with Pearl Jam. <laughs> 
There could have been Elvis and Kanye. There could have been Elvis and Michael Jackson. There could have been Elvis and all of those stars. You know, we look at Paul McCartney today, just dropped a new record. Willie Nelson just dropped a new record. These people are still performing at the highest level, still gifting us with what they have. And Elvis could have done that too. Elvis could still be doing it. He would not be that old now. 42 years old, the king died in a hideous, lonely, and awful way. And that says a lot about the industry. It says a lot about pharmaceuticals. It says a lot about how the people who have everything also have everything to lose. And the king did, man. But I want you to forget about that king. I want you to forget about Viva Los Elvis. And I want you to go back and watch the 1968 comeback special. And you'll see the real freaking deal, man. And go to Spotify, the John Huff podcast referenced on the podcast playlist. And I will put a mess of blues on there. (laughs) You can check that out. What a great blues song that is. Warms my cockles, man. Go check out some real deal old school Elvis and you'll see what I'm talking about, all right? Now, this is the moment where I would normally drop in a drum bumper. I think I'm going to dispense with the drum bumpers, all right? Got to tie up some odds and ends. I wanted to talk about Elvis. We did that. But I got to say some condolences and some fond farewells to some folks, man. And first among those is the great Jeff Labar, guitar player from Cinderella, part of my youth. Jeff Labar passed away a few weeks ago. Very, very sad. And, you know, another one of these guys who was not an old man. But I mentioned Jeff partly because I freaking love Cinderella and he's part of the soundtrack to my youth. But also I interviewed Jeff Labar one time back when I was doing the London Groove Machine blog. His publicist reached out to me and I got to sit down via telephone for like 45 minutes with Jeff Labar. And that's a surreal thing, man. (laughs) It's a very surreal thing to interview people who you have watched and, you know, famous people. Jeff was releasing a solo record at the time. I want to say it was called One for the Road or something like that. Very poignant, you know, given what's happened since then. But he was so candid about his substance abuse problems and the industry and divorce and how much all of that took a toll not only on his personal life and well-being, but on his band. And he basically has acknowledged subsequently that the reason there's been no Cinderella for the last 10 years is because he couldn't get his act together. And Kiefer just wouldn't do it. You know, if there was going to be this sort of substancy Jeff Labar, that's one of the things. And he has freely admitted, and he was extremely candid to me about how substances have affected his life, you know, and how hard that's been for him. And he was just the nicest guy. He gave me one of the best interviews I've ever done because he was just honest and he was humble and he seemed thrilled that anybody wanted to talk to him. And that's kind of a sad thing, man, because when you've been in Cinderella and Cinderella was among the biggest rock bands in the world for a while and you've been that guy and then it kind of comes crashing down and then 20 years later, you know, you're just kind of pleased anybody remembers who you are. But he was super humble, super gracious. Very friendly, very willing to talk to me. And it just makes me kind of sad now that Jeff Labar died. Because he's another guy who could have had a chapter, you know? I remember reading an interview with him recently where he talked about he had the solo thing going, had a band together, and they were trying to play gigs and stuff. And he's like, I'm just too old to carry the stuff. <laughs> when Cinderella tours, we have a crew, man. We don't pile into the van with a trailer, and then it's these middle-of-the-night shows, and... It's like, that takes a toll. I feel it. There have been times when my back has been, you know, kind of wonky and I'm out there trying to carry drums and play. It's dicey, man. And when you've been at the heights he's been at, very tough to come down. You know, very tough to come down from that. And he struggled with it. I think he probably wanted Cinderella to play again so he could get back to where he belongs, you know? Tom, lift us up where we belong. Didn't happen. Now Jeff Labar is gone and we mourn the passing. And, of course, Jordy Jordanson's gone, and that's a stunner. I was never a huge Slipknot guy, you know, the, the, a lot of the modern stuff I didn't really get into, but legend, you know, young legend, amazing freaking metal drummer, and 
just another sad one. And Dusty Hill of ZZ Top. You know, there's hardly any of us who are into rock music who can't trace some influence to ZZ Top, man. <laughs> I'm a King's X fan and a Galactic Cowboys fan, and it goes directly to ZZ Top, okay? If you're into any of that kind of bluesy stuff, ZZ Top is part of it somewhere along the way. So we lost Dusty Hill, and just yesterday, this is Monday, kids. Monday as I'm recording. Just yesterday, I got the news that Marky Post died of cancer. 70 freaking years old, and that ain't right. And you know if you've been listening along this year, that I've been on kind of a a night court marathon. (laughs) And everybody who was around in the 80s when night court was happening had just a little thing, at least a little thing, for Christine Sullivan, a.k.a. Marky Post. And by all accounts, she was just a real sweetheart and taken by cancer. And that sucks, man. Life can be difficult in that way. And I would like to give you something pithy right now. You know, something poignant, some piece of wisdom about how all these young deaths, not that young in Dusty's case, not even, I guess, that young in Marky Post's case. You know, how these deaths, you know, it's supposed to sort of shock you into some observation of the world, some realization of what's important. But if COVID hasn't brought us to that, <laughs> I'm not sure losing Marky Post is going to. But it is sad. It's sad to see the icons kind of go. But I want to bring you down, all right? I do intend to keep these episodes shorter. We are running leaner, kids. But I do want to tell you that there is a glimmer of hope on the horizon. In fact, the glimmer of hope is here because the official announcement has come down of the new War on Drugs record, which will be released in October. And can you get behind that, man? The new album is called I Don't Live Here Anymore. It is out on October 29th. They have dropped a single called Living Proof, which is an interesting little choice, man. Usually a band drops a single, they're going to drop the catchiest mofo on the record, going to do the video and all that stuff. War on Drugs dropped something very different from that. This very kind of quiet, introspective, very gentle song called Living Proof. Now, I've heard some of what's on the record, right? When you run a music podcast and you happen to turn up on Instagram at just the right moment, <laughs> when Adam Grandesil is going live, and he's playing songs over Instagram from the studio. You know, when you run a podcast and you get lucky with the timing, you get that privilege. So I've heard some of the tunes, three or four of them, and it's War on Drugs, man. It's, there's some bangers on there. There's some really great stuff coming. But this Living Proof song is very different. Not what you would expect, necessarily, in a lead single for a record. But it's a great song, so you should go and listen to it. I will also put that on the John Huff Podcast, reference on the podcast playlist. So you'll find A Mess of Blues, you'll find Living Proof on there, provided it's on Spotify. And it's cool, and I'm stoked, and I'm stoked for the new record. And I'll tell you right now, kids, 2022 is going to be okay, because I got tickets for the War on Drugs in Toronto. Man, this has become a bucket list band for me, one of my favorite bands of all time. Finally going to get to see them at the Queen Elizabeth Theatre on the grounds of The X, where I saw Maria Bamford, my favorite comedian these days, you know? Great little room. Holds about 1,100 people, nice and intimate. It's going to be freaking great. That's in February. They're doing two shows. I believe it's a Saturday and a Sunday. So if you want to see the war on drugs, those of you who are in uh, southern Ontario, Toronto and Feb, all right? You guys in the States, a whole run of American dates coming for the war on drugs. And all of my European listeners, they're coming to see you guys too, all right? So check out New War on Drugs. Get your tickets while you can, all right? I have a feeling they are a live band not to be missed. I've watched a ton of War on Drugs footage, and I'm stoked, man, because Charlie Hall. Charlie Hall is a great inspiration to me as a drummer. My friends have talked about that before. I will not put that out again today. Maybe talk about it later when the record comes out, you know? But I'm going to wrap up. It's time to go. What I want you to do, I'm not even going to say what I want you to do. What I'm going to ask you to do is, this is a hip thing to say. I want you to smash that like button. (laughs) 
want you to smash that subscribe button, kids. Wherever you listen to podcasts, please do subscribe. Please do leave me a rating and review. I know I say that a lot. Every podcaster does because it counts, because it's important. And I found one in my travels. You know, when I'm, when I'm on the iTunes, the default library that comes up is the Canadian iTunes, right? So, I, you know, most of the reaction to my show is there. And thank you to everyone who has rated and reviewed there. But I was on the UK iTunes, and somebody on there quite a while back called Number One Curtis over there in the UK who left me a very lovely little review back in 2020. Didn't know that, Number One Curtis, or I would have acknowledged that forthwith. But I wasn't on the UK iTunes. I was on the Canadian one. So bless you, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate you listening. Hope you still are. The rest of you, please, you know, drop me a rating, drop me a review. It helps, man. I'm trying to make this a thing. And it helps to do that. And share these episodes if you like them. Drop me a line. Let me know what you're listening to. Let me know what you react to in this episode. Let me know you're checking out the king, man. I'm gonna go. You can find me on Twitter, although I'm not doing a whole lot on Twitter these days. Facebook, John Huff Podcast. Find me on the Instagram at uh, JW underscore Huff. That's where most of the action is these days. Do give me a follow. You know, do drop me a line. Hope you're doing great. And I don't know. Guess I'm going to check out. All right. So I will check you later.